No Warhammer tables complete without some terrain on it. And I think the coolest terrain is what you can make out of household junk or whatever you have lying around that might be otherwise thrown away. I want to show you how you could take these materials and make a really cool muddy crater piece of terrain for your war games. To begin, we're going to make a base out of cardboard. You'll notice that inside most of it, there's this corrugated section. Cardboard is a super readily available material, but its main flaw is warping. To get around that, we're going to take two pieces and make sure the corrugation is running in opposite directions, making it stronger. You could definitely use foam or some other material for this, but I'm aiming to make this as approachable as possible. I glue my two sections together, making sure the corrugation is opposite and leave it to dry. Once it's dry, I draw a rough outline for the shape of the base. I'm going for a circle. Then using that as a guide, I carefully cut it out with my X-Acto. I make sure to cut it at an angle to create a beveled edge for the base and go super slowly, repositioning if I feel any sort of resistance and making sure I cut away from myself. I use scissors to trim off any loose bits left over from cutting away the main shape. To build out the main form of the crater, I'm going to be using aluminum foil. I tear off a sheet and crunch it into a rough tube, bending it into shape. I create what is basically a donut, going section by section, making sure to pat it down, making it dense, so there's no air pockets, which will lead to a weak point. This is a technique used by ceramic artists and sculptors, and it's a really easy and cheap way to create volume. Once I have a shape I'm happy with, I use hot glue to secure it to the base. I know tin foil is used in cooking and goes in the oven, but since we're potentially making fumes here, it's probably best to wear a mask. I glue my initial pieces on and then decide to add a bit more to bulk up the crater. I also go around and hit the edges of my glue gun just to really lock it in place and make sure there's no loose parts. One of the main causes of warping is when a wet material like paint is added to a porous surface. The moisture gets inside and when the water evaporates, the dry paint contracts, pulling the cardboard with it. I'm going to add a thin coat of matte medium to seal the surface, preventing the moisture from seeping in. You could also use whatever cheap paint you have lying around, just don't thin it down with water. Additionally, a little trick artists like to do is to add some preliminary paint to both sides of a project, lessening the warping. As both sides are contracting, creating opposing forces. This might be more of an artist's wife's tale, but between this and our crisscross cardboard, I think we should be pretty safe from any warping. Once this is dried, I'm going to be covering the tin foil with a sort of paper mache. This helps make it more durable and also creates a cool stone-like texture. I create this by first taking white glue and adding water until it's quite thin and runny. My main material here is actually toilet paper. I rip some off, fold it up, and then dab some of my watered-down glue onto the surface. I press the toilet paper on, forming it with my fingers. Once I have it adhered, I go ahead and dab a little more glue on top, letting it soak in. To make sure the tin foil is all the way covered, I also do a second layer around most of the crater. Another technique is to take a blob of toilet paper and dip it right in the glue, and then press it on. I did this mostly around the edges to create a slope, blending it into the base. You're going to want to let this sit overnight to dry completely. As you can see, after it's fully dried, the surface is quite solid and it's ready to add some earth texture. This is a trick I learned from Midwinter Minis. You can create a really cool texture paste by using old coffee grounds and paint. I'd head over to that channel for the full scoop, but I stuck mine in the oven at about 180 degrees until it was fully dried, which took about an hour or two. Once it had cooled down, I added matte medium. Any paint will do, I just happen to have a large tub of this. And I like that it dries clear, resulting in a coffee colored finish. 
You want to add enough until you've got something like a frosting consistency. Super spreadable, but also has some body to it. Once this is mixed up, I apply it to the sides of the base, just like you would frost a cake. Smearing it on, making sure I got all the holes and gaps in the cardboard. After the sides were done, I moved on to the stone section. I knew I wanted this to be mostly covered, leaving a couple sections of rock sticking up. Human brains are really good at making patterns, but this can make things look too uniform and not organic. Knowing this, I tried to focus on creating a large, medium, and small section of rock sticking out of the texture paste. And make sure you give this at least a day to dry. As it does so, it's going to develop a really nice crackle texture. But because of that, it might also peel away from the base a little bit. So it could be useful to go back in and repair some of those gaps. For a base coat, I mixed up an earthy brown. First by making a deep purple and then adding a bit of yellow to it. My original mix was a bit light, so I added some black and slapped it all over, making sure to not go on too thick since I didn't want to cover up any of that nice texture we've created. To help get into the nooks and crannies, I did small circular motions with my brush, really wedging the bristles in there. Because this is such an irregular shape, there was a ton of little white spots and small gaps that I missed. I added some water to my paint to thin it out, and then pressed my brush onto the surface, letting the paint run into those hard to reach places. To paint the stone, I added white to my brown color and dabbed it onto the high points of the rock. I then took a smaller brush and began to feather it out, creating a subtle gradient. We're looking to pick out all the rock parts, but want to avoid a hard line where it meets the dirt, as in nature this would be a softer transition. This technique helped me attain a good coverage, but also created a natural looking texture. I add even more white to my mix and repeat the same steps, dabbing it on and then feathering it out, but this time leaving some of the previous coat showing. Then I split my base color in half, adding some white and scarlet to one part, creating a lighter pink hue. I set this aside for now. I then take the not pink half, add even more white, and creating a final highlight and apply it sparingly dabbing on small sections and mostly dry brushing to blend it in. Afterwards, I roughly stipple on my pink mixture around the edges of the rock and in some of the deeper sections. This helps to create some variety in the hue of the rock, making it look more natural, as in real life it wouldn't be so one note. This is then all tied together with a final dry brush of the highlight color. To paint the dirt part, I dry brush on Vallejo's charred brown and incremental amounts of orange brown. I only use a couple drops of each, so I don't mind using my nicer paint for this section. With that, the painting's basically done, and instead it's now time to add some vegetation to bring it to life. To do this, I scrape some green, erasable colored pencil shavings and mix some watered-down sepia ink into it. Because the binder on the erasable pencil isn't as strong as a typical one, this is going to stain the ink green, but also give us a bit of texture from the shavings. Using a more typical waxy colored pencil will result in the ink being mostly its original color, but the shavings stain green, creating a more contrasting look. I slosh this onto the crater, focusing mostly on the transitional areas between rock and dirt and wherever I think moss or vegetation would grow. I also make sure I'm catching the shavings in my brush to deposit it onto the surface. Once it dries, we have this great variety of color with yellow greens where the mixture was thin and then deep emeralds where the shavings have gathered. For a final touch, we're gonna to be adding some mud into the crater. This is a fun touch that's super easy to make. I take some white glue and add a drop of charred brown paint. Then I add water in until it's a spreadable consistency. 
You want to apply this with an even application until the desired area is fully covered. Also, if you make a mistake and get somewhere it shouldn't be, just take a clean brush full of water and flood the area, breaking up the glue. Then all you need to do is soak it up with a paper towel. As you can see, it dries much darker as the white of the glue is now transparent. Depending on how watery your mix was, pigment will collect along the edges and overall it will shrink a bit. It's also worth pointing out that any bubbles will still be present once it's dried, which I think is super cool, but if you want to get rid of them, just make sure to pop them while still wet. It dries semi-transparent and glossy, creating a great mud effect that looks great on bases too. And there you have it, a great looking terrain piece that will be an awesome addition to any war game or tabletop adventure. The best part about it is that it was made completely out of junk that you probably have lying around the house. Thanks so much for watching the video. I hope this inspires you to make some low budget terrain to litter your Warhammer games or D&D nights with or just gives you a fun crafting opportunity. Happy hobbying.